Quasi-experiments. Let's say that Bob invents a new method for teaching statistics. He has the instructor dress up as a ninja and teach using excessive metaphors. Central Limit Theorem, the iceberg of statistics. Hiding such a deep foundation, but also liable to wreck the ships of weary researchers and melt under the light of confusion. I look more like a Sith Lord to me. Bob also wants to compare his method to the old way of doing things. You know, with like a regular instructor who doesn't dress up as a ninja. And he has two stats classes, an AP stats class and a regular old stats class. And so he decides that his AP stats class is going to receive the ninja training. And after a semester, he finds that his AP class does way better than the regular class. Now hold up a minute. I see all sorts of problems with this study. How do you know it was the instruction method and not the fact that these were AP kids? Exactly, my young Padawan. You don't know. We have a name for this particular predicament. You remember what it is? A confound. Yes, a confound. Remember, a confound is an alternative explanation for something. Is it the teaching method that made the difference or was it the fact that one was an AP class? That's a confound. Previously, we dealt with confounds using experiments, which had manipulation, control, and random assignment. Or micra. Uh, man, confounds are annoying. That's what the mnemonic was. Yeah, that's what it was. But sometimes we can't do experiments. Sometimes we do have manipulation, but we don't have the high degree of control, and we don't have random assignment. In which case, we talk about quasi-experiments. So let's talk about some examples of quasi-experiments, shall we? We could have teaching method A versus teaching method B in different classrooms. So the teaching method is manipulated, but people aren't randomly assigned. Or we could look at therapist A clients versus therapist B. B clients, and we randomly assign one therapist to receive the new treatment. The new treatment is manipulated, but participants are not randomly assigned to the therapist. Let's say we have a hundred people that for six weeks do one sort of training, and then after six weeks they switch to another sort of training. So the new training program is manipulated, but there's actually no control group here. Instead, subjects initially train in the control group. So now let's talk a little bit more about threats to validity. Ba -ba 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 -ba. Quasi experiments are way more flexible than experiments, but we have more threats to validity to worry about. So let's review some of those and add some more, shall we? History. That means something happens outside of the lab that causes the effect that we see, not the treatment or the manipulation itself. For example, let's say with a group we have six weeks of baseline measures and then we have some sort of a exercise propaganda program and then we measure them six weeks after that. But let's just say just when the exercise propaganda starts, spring hits and lots of people are more motivated to go outside, go garden, go hiking, those sorts of things. So what is responsible for the change in people is not the exercise propaganda, but it's the fact that springtime happened to arrive right when the propaganda started. Maturation. That means the natural growth of participants is what's responsible for the observed effect, not the fact that the treatment was manipulated. For example, let's say people participate in a meditation class. We measure their blood pressure at the beginning of the meditation class, and then we measure their blood pressure at the end of meditation class. Well, guess what? When people come into a new environment, their blood pressure is going to spike because it's unfamiliar. But then after an hour of meditation, maybe it's not the meditation that has caused their blood pressure to go down, but maybe they've just habituated to the environment. It ain't so foreign no more. And then we have instrumentation. Instrumentation means that the instruments we use to measure people change over time. For example, let's say you have an instrument that measures sexual aggression, for example. This actually comes from one of my students. And one of the items asks, how frequently do you hen peck? How frequently do you pet? Does anybody know what hen pecking or petting means? No, because we're not in the 50s anymore. So these were expressions people use back in the 50s and they don't have meaning today because people don't use those terms anymore. And so the instrument has changed over time, or at least people's perceptions of the instrument has changed over time. And so if you're using that instrument to measure something 50 years ago, it's gonna be very different than if you use that same measure today. Next, regression to the mean. Regression to the mean basically means that people return to their baseline. So for example, often people don't see a therapist until things get really bad, like they get super depressed. And so for them, being that depressed is an outlier. Well, what happens is naturally over time, people People who are really depressed eventually come back to their baseline or their average. And so if they're seeing a therapist at the time, they might attribute that to the therapist when in reality it's just regression to the mean. They're just going back to their baseline. Selection. Selection means that the characteristics of people are responsible for the change that you see, not the treatment itself. Just think about the example that I used at the beginning with the ninja training method. It's not the fact that people were taught with a ninja that made them better. It's the fact that the people who are in AP stats are very different than the people who are in regular stats. So the difference is due to their characteristics, not the training method. And then finally, we have attrition. Attrition means that the observed effect is due to subject dropout 
not due to the fact that there was some sort of a treatment effect. For example, let's say we measure weight loss in people before and after exercise. But here's the thing, only the most motivated people will stick with an exercise program. And so you might have half the people drop out because they couldn't stick with it. Or because they weren't losing any weight, they didn't find any benefit from it. And so at the end of the study, all you have is half the people, and those are the ones who actually stuck with the program. And so what you're really measuring is the effect of being able to stick with any exercise program, not the fact that this particular exercise program was special. Make sense? So that brings us to quasi experiments. There are two categories of quasi experimental designs. There are one group designs, meaning that there is no comparison group. These include a one group pretest post test design, a one group post test only design, and an interrupted time series. And the second type is called a non equivalent groups design, which means that we have a comparison group, but subjects were randomly assigned to the two different groups. And likewise, we have the exact same types of designs a post test only design, a pretest and a post test design, and a interrupted time series design. Except all these have non equivalent groups and see this handy decision tree. Boy, that is handy. So let's talk about one group designs. One group post test only. These designs are absolutely useless. So as an example, let's say we measure people's satisfaction after a yoga class. That's useless because you have nothing to compare it to. What is satisfied? A five, a six, a seven? I don't know. Are they low? Are they high? We have no idea. Because again, there is no comparison. And let's say you do know what satisfied looks like. Even then you can't know for sure if it was the yoga that caused it. So that brings us to a one group pretest post test design. So let's modify our previous example. In this one, we would measure people's satisfaction satisfaction before yoga and then their satisfaction after yoga. So there's an improvement. Now we can know if there is a difference. Now we can know if people are getting more satisfied after yoga. But the problem is we don't know that it was the yoga that caused it. It could be history. Something happened outside of the lab that made them happier. It could be maturation. They were just naturally developing to be more satisfied people. It could be regression to the mean. They came to yoga because they were super depressed and then things just naturally fell back into place and now they're okay again. Or maybe it's attrition that people who sucked at yoga dropped out and those were the most unsatisfied satisfied people and so you don't end up measuring those people. So this is a relatively weak design too. And then finally we have an interrupted time series. And in this design we measure people multiple times before the treatment and then multiple times after the treatment. So we might, for example, measure satisfaction six weeks before the class starts for every week or something like that. And then they come to yoga and then we measure them six weeks after the class. And look at this handy data graphic. So if they have a massive boost in satisfaction right when yoga starts, well, maybe it's the yoga that caused it. Now, is it possible that the change happened because of history, that something happened outside of the lab that caused them to be more satisfied? Sure, but that would be rare for it to happen exactly when the yoga training started. And likewise with maturation and regression to the mean. They could be responsible for the effect, but it's unlikely that it happened at the exact same time that yoga training started. But attrition is still going to threaten the internal validity of this design. So now let's talk about non-equivalent groups designs. Before we had to compare people to their baseline measures if we had them. Now we can strengthen the validity if we have a comparison group. But again, this group is self-selected. They weren't randomly assigned to this group. So that makes it a lot harder to dismiss confounds. So let's talk about some non-equivalent groups designs. Let's say you have have two community exercise program. One happens on a Monday night, one happens on a Wednesday night. So you randomly decide one of them is going to do yoga and the other one's going to do stretching. And we want to conclude that yoga increases satisfaction relative to stretching. So this is going to help immensely with threats to validity. So the same threats might be operating, but if they're going to happen to one group, they're probably going to happen to the other group equally. So if something happens outside the lab, it's probably going to affect both groups. And so on average, the effects are going to wash out. But now selection remains a problem. So remember, the two groups were not randomly assigned. Maybe there's a systematic difference between the type of people who choose a Monday night class versus a Wednesday night class. So maybe the Monday class is filled with go-getters, people who just want to start the week off right. And if they get the yoga training, then you're going to have people who are go-getters in one group and people who are not go-getters in the other group. So it's not going to be a fair comparison. And worse yet, selection can interact with some of these other threats to validity. So for example, the go-getters in the yoga group might experience maturation at a faster rate than the non-go-getters. Or in other words, they're learning to be be satisfied quicker than the people in the exercise group. Or maybe these people regress to the mean faster than the people in the other group. Or maybe they experience lower rates of attrition than the other group. Again, because of selection, because these people are different, etc. So we still have threats to validity, but it's still a stronger design. Just as before, we have a post-test only design, except now we have a non-equivalent group post-test design. Wow, that's a mouthful. So you just measure satisfaction at the end of the two groups. And then you can compare the scores for the stretching group versus the yoga group. But the observed difference maybe because they differed in their baseline satisfaction, that the Monday night group just happened to be more satisfied. So you don't know whether it's 
their original satisfaction or because of the yoga. We also have a non-equivalent group pre-test, post-test design. Wow, who invented these terms? We need some cool acronyms or something. Og pt, og pt, ingit pt, Non-equivalent pre-test, post-test design. Yeah, that's way easier, isn't it? In this design, for example, we might measure satisfaction before and after either the yoga training or the stretching training. So this is an improvement over the previous design. If the go-getters are more satisfied from the beginning, we're going to be able to control for that because we measured them at the beginning. And it's going to show up in their pretest scores. And then we can statistically control for it later. But the problem, like I said, is that selection can interact with the other threats of validity. Again, they might mature at a faster rate. They might, they might regress to the mean at a faster rate than the people in the stretching group. And then we have an interrupted time series design, but this is with a non-equivalent group. So just as before, we measure them multiple times before and multiple times after, except this time you're doing it in two groups. Hopefully you see something like this. Wow, that's a cool graphic, right? And so you'll notice that, that for the stretching group, when the intervention was implemented, they had marginal improvements in satisfaction. On the other hand, those in the treatment group or in the yoga group, after the treatment was initiated, they had massive leaps in satisfaction satisfaction. So this is a improvement over the previous design because again, is it possible that something, some history happened outside the lab at that specific time point? It's possible, but unlikely. And likewise with maturation or regression to the mean, these things could have happened right when the treatment was implemented, but it's very unlikely. But again, selection may still interact with these things, but it's less likely that it's going to happen at that particular point where the treatment is implemented. So with that, let's review our learning objectives. What is the definition of a quasi experiment? It is a situation where we have a manipulation, but we are lacking either a random assignment or we are lacking a high degree of control. Internal validity in quasi-experiments. Remember, once we give up that random assignment, we lose a lot of internal validity or we introduce more threats to validity. Threats to quasi-experiments. And in this video, we've talked about history, maturation, instrumentation, regression to the mean, attrition, and selection. Know the different types of one-group designs. Post-test only, pre-test and post-test, and an interrupted time series. But be sure to remember what these are and be able to identify them. And then finally, know the different non-equivalent groups designs. And those are the same. We have a post-test only, a pre-test, post-test, and an interrupted time series. But this time we have a non-equivalent control group to compare it to. So with that, peace out.